I'm going to do a quick lecture on, uh, you know, the difference between kind of a more conservative based culture and a more progressive or liberal minded culture when it comes to um, helping people with substance use disorder or treating people with substance use disorder in a harm reduction efforts to, um, you know, save people taxes as well as kind of provide the client or person, you know, with services, you know, that basically keeps them out of prison and allows them to be a functioning member of society. So I'm from Cheatham County and Cheatham County is one of the leaders in harm reduction. So we came up with things like rapid access to MAT. We came up with things like, um, you know, creative ways to change the way we prescribed uh, opioids for acute pain management in our ER. Um, you know, Chittenden County does a lot of kind of stuff like that when it comes to being the leaders of hub and spoke and other types of, you know, harm reduction strategies when it comes to treating the opiate, um, you know, the opiate crisis. And, and that's where I'm from. And I got to work with them in our district court when our district court kind of switched the way that they adjudicate and the way that the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecutes and the way that they do supervision and things like that, as well as kind of seeing progressive policies in, in local probation and paroles um, when it came to violating people for things like cannabis usage. But um, when you look at like a difference in culture, Chittenden County almost always votes progressive or Democrat when it comes to mayors, um, senators, house, um, local representatives on select boards. Um, it's just a different uh, culture. And if you look at why that culture exists in Rutlands of a more kind of conservative minded individual, it's actually because most of the jobs came from Proctor. So if you travel about 30 miles, you know, from Rutland's uh, maybe 15. What you have is a cool little quarry called Proctor. It's the Proctor Rock Quarry. And I think they used to harvest marble, you know, um, mine marble out of that um, particular quarry. And if you look at kind of, you know, Rutland's infrastructure, you can see a lot of that marble in place on some of their like, um, you know, historic buildings and stuff like that, which is a different kind of issue in, in Burlington. The first thing I noticed in Rutland beyond, you know, the amphetamine kind of, you know, surge after the opiate crisis um, was basically the municipal budget is very difficult to fund. So you have towns like Shrewsbury, you have towns like even Killington, you have towns around Rutland, you know, especially around Killington, um, you know, Ludlow, stuff like that, that have more money than they know what to do with when it comes to property values and property taxes um, and being able to fund, you know, things like waitresses or landscaping businesses. And then you have, you know, Rutland, which has been, you know, affected by crime and is largely manufacturing jobs and blue collar families um, in, in, in a difference in property values. So, you know, what happens in a city like, you know, Rutland when they can't maintain property values, like, you know, Burlington has different coatings. So things like historic buildings and, uh, you know, slate roofs and wood frames, windows, it's a different coating. And a lot of the landlords, you know, need to like even keep fresh paint on their buildings to be able to own a property in Burlington, a rental property in Burlington. And what that does is it increases property values. So it's just the way that they pull these two. Generally, more stuff is brushed under the rug. It's a college town. It's a tourism town. So, you know, Burlington has a higher property value because it looks nicer, seems nicer, you know, on the surface has less crime, um, you know, has more, you know, stuff to do because they're a college town. attracts more people for tourism. Um, buildings are just worth more and, and because of the stuff we've talked about. And as a result, the property values are a lot more. And when you have increased property values, what happens is the 2% on average that we pay in Vermont for property taxes by town, and it's by town or by city, um, go to fund the municipal budget. And when you have a higher municipal budget, what that does is gives us more money for policing or progressive policing, you know, law enforcement interacting with the public in a different way to uh, enact, you know, public safety efforts um, that I talk about all the time that we were trying to do before crack cocaine decimated um, inner cities and people of color in New York City in the 1990s, which is one of the reasons why I lecture about things like United Blood Nation and ways to kind of combat that um, without spending any money at all. Um, you know, but what happened is, is we kind of went back towards the more militant, strict, disciplined policing styles that Vollmer put in place in order to kind of, you know, prevent corruption in the police force in the 20s at the same time that Hoover was kind of starting starting the FBI. But kind of if, if you backtrack, what we're talking about is, is property values. And then the other thing that I noticed in Rutland was their municipal budget's out of control. So not only did I get to graduate from probably the best public school system in, in the state and one of the best in the country when we're talking about public schools. Um, and I took John Hopkins. So John Hopkins is saying that I'm in the top 1% 
of smartest people in the country. And I took it in science at the time in third and fourth grade. I had algebra and Spanish one credit before I graduated grade, the eighth grade before I went into high school. Um, and I did not skip grades, even though I could have. What I was was funny. And that basically allowed me to work with people. And that's why sociology is my favorite subject and not or the social sciences and not not uh, not uh, STEM because that's what my parents taught me. But, you know, to, to, to take a step back, the reason the public schools are so awesome in Williston is because people moved to that area for IBM. So people moved to Burlington, moved to Essex for IBM and, and other things like that. And what happens is we have, you know, other people going there for jobs, you know, like the Burton factory and stuff like that. And what happens with those types of jobs is we own properties that are worth more money and thus we pay more money to our schools and our schools make more money. It's why like Act 250 went into place years ago in order to basically have uh, funding for, you know, school districts or whatever that couldn't afford, you know, the same level of education that I got, you know, at Williston Central or CVU. And if you kind of like, you know, you know, backtrack, what I'm getting at is, is the second thing I noticed when I came to Rutland was their sheriff's cars are decrepit, you know, so the sheriffs that are doing traffic control, you know, their cars are are, are basically falling apart. So, I mean, like, this is the municipal budget in, 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 in the police, you know, system, let alone have, you know, programs like, you know, not chill, but what we used to do in Williston to have kids have um, snowboard equipment so they could go up to Cochran's for things like hockey, because Raha, the Raha Raiders, just started a few years ago you know we went through this in Shannon County because my father and my father's friends uh well my father were division one hockey players at Academy at the University of Vermont so I mean what that did for hockey in Shannon County was I won more state titles than anybody else and I went to regionals and we were able to build hockey rinks and a cool athletic facility in South Burlington to help keep our kids off drugs and stuff like that um, but we started our program of, of uh, CSB um, decades before you guys had any, any hockey programs down here. And I know that because I was a six-time state hockey champ. I should have been the assistant captain of the Catamounts. That's how I was raised from the time I was four years old. Um, you know, but you can't you know, provide those types of you know, you know, organizations and stuff like that, you know, equipment or anything else to get kids into hockey instead of drugs. You know, and that's what we did at Williston was we had snowboard equipment to get people into skiing instead of drugs. You can't do that if you don't have money. And Governor Scott's kind of thing for many, many years and recently has changed his tune and suddenly he wants to go to Washington was like, you know, what we can do to reduce the budget deficit is change the student staff ratio. You know, what we can do is, is, is kind of cut funding to schools. And it's like, you know, Governor, like I propose stuff to reduce the budget by 0.5 percent. Um you know, through criminal justice reform and substance use care. So, like, I've offered to give the legislature my programming that I own the rights to for something like $45,000. I've offered to do that to free up funding, and it gives people treatment. The infrastructure already exists. You know, I've offered to save the state of Vermont money while preventing fatal overdoses and and providing substance use care. Um, And now I'm engaged in a legal battle because they didn't want to respect an advocate. You know, and Governor Scott's response to a eight billion dollar budget this year, seven billion dollar budget last year. Typically, our budget's about seven billion dollars, and four billion of that accounts for health and human services, and that's substance use care, that's criminal justice, it's what I do for work. Um, you know, but you know that's that that was his response was cut funding to public schools. So it's like okay, you know, I'm saying that human services is the real issue from mental health to anything else. And people get caught up in the human service system when they don't have education. I mean, that that's just, just like common sense. You know, so cutting funding to education, you know, basically makes the actual tax burden of human services increase because people aren't getting educated. And when people aren't educated, you know, they break the law. When people aren't educated, they need mental health treatment because they don't have anything else. When people aren't educated, they need substance use treatment. When people aren't educated, they go to prison. You know, and I'm not blaming him. It's what he knows. But there's a reason I voted for David Zuckerman. And, and, and that was that. You know, but when you look at basically lower property values, when you look at lower property values, you know, paying into a lower municipality budget, you see patrol division with local law enforcement be supported by Vermont State Police in most neighborhoods. You see patrol division by local law enforcement of Rutland Police supported by patrol division of sheriffs. So in Lamoille County, it's just sheriffs, sheriffs do patrol division. In Burlington, it's really just Burlington police. 
you know, but because property values are low and crime is high and stuff like that, what happens is is the municipal budget can't support a school system and then the kids don't get the education and the kids end up selling drugs or using drugs. So, you know, the real question that we should be asking is how can we free up money for our schools while keeping the community safe and while keeping the community, you know, off drugs and stuff like that. Beyond all the programming that anyone the rights to, you know, the simple answer is a manufacturing plant. So if if you have a manufacturing plant, you know, what you can do is provide jobs for people that want or out of work or people that are struggling to get a decent job, you know, that have substance use problems and are ready to have a career in manufacturing, especially if they grew up in Rutland with the type of socioeconomic status that they're used to. So how do you how do you help stimulate manufacturing jobs or something like that? Well, there's lots of ways you can do that with business commerce and stuff like that. But if you want to free up city money, if you want more city money, you know, what you do is you invest in city bonds, you invest in town bonds. I'm a very conservative people when it comes to my investment strategies, meaning I invest in local bonds, I invest in land, and I try to give back to the community with my time. Like, for example, you know, if Rutland invested in kind of changing uh, the mall into basically what it is, which is a community place where people go and I do MMA there, I, I you know, I help the kids play hockey up there, people walk up there all the time, you know, there is spray can art in the right form, if you have a blank wall where people can go up and do spray can art, you know, and then they can do it without destroying property, you know, if you turn that, you know, decrepit building into a community center, you know, what you have is a place where kids can go to not use drugs, and then there's people like me that are, I don't watch TV, I get bored at night, so what I do is I coach hockey for free, I keep kids off drugs at night because I get bored. I ride. Hey, hey, you got four dollars, bro. You want a beer for four dollars? One beer. Come play stick it back with us. You know, you you can learn from a kid that could have skated with the catamounts. You know, like uh, the the ice skates that I wear. Like I won't skate on Gutterson, but if I wore actual ice skates, the only the place I have any business skating is on Gutterson. Like I'm not good at hockey. Like come skate with us, bro. Four dollars. So I mean, you know what what that does is you know it allows kind of the the community to have a community place to gather and function and stuff like that and helps, you know, a substance use effort when it comes to keeping kids educated, keeping kids involved with families, keeping kids involved with families in their neighborhoods and a concerted effort towards substance use care before the child ever gets involved with criminal deviance or substance use care. And you can do that by buying state, excuse me, by buying city bonds. And you buy city bonds, it funds up funding to do things like start community centers. And there is one down at Gurgetti and stuff like that, but it's just there's a lot of people that congregate up there. Um, so it makes you think of what you can do with that type of property, um, especially when there's an ice rink up there already. But like, I, I digress. What I'm talking about is like, how can you have a higher municipal budget um, in the city of Rutland because they can barely afford to police? And they can barely afford to police because of the count, because of the the culture and counterculture that exists in Rutland. So it's a conservative culture and a manufacturing job would be nice. You know, more community programs would be nice. But when you look at what we do in, in, in Chittenden County, you know, we don't just brush policing under the rug like the commander of our patrol division talks about. What we do is, is we're open and honest about our substance use. You know, me and my friends talk about our heroin addiction. It's not a big deal for us. You know, yeah, we got into heroin. I should have played for the cats. You know, instead of being assistant catamount, assistant captain of the catamounts, I got into heroin. You know, that's part of my story. I'm honest about it. And most of my friends say the same stuff. And a lot of us, you know, got into drugs up there. You know, but because we're kind of more open and honest about it, there's less stigma. So there's less stigma around using substances in Burlington so people can use safe. So our safe injection site, um, excuse me, our harm reduction um, kind of, uh, you know, office of operations that's actually a, a clean syringe exchange operates five days a week. So five days a week, you can go in there and you can get medically assisted treatment basically on demand. And you can do the same thing in our ER. You know, so you can walk into our safe syringe exchange. You can get access to, to access the treatment, access to health care. You can get clean syringes. You can get information on substance use care. You can see kind of what drugs are risky and kind of, you know, be in the know and just chill. You know, they're, they're decent people. So instead of chilling with a guy that just wants to sell you the bag to get the $10, you're chilling with someone who's probably been through it or a nurse that cares, you know, and that's the kind of vibe that they have up there. And that, and, you know, yeah, you can come and get your syringes or whatever, but just chill out and talk to us, you know, like, and, and because of that different attitude, because of that different kind of culture, 
towards substance use care where me and my friends are pretty honest about our addiction and we do special interest stories about people, you know, rather than just talk about, you know, criminal acts and stuff like that, you know, there's less stigma. And because there's less stigma towards using, you know, narcotics, people use clean syringes. And when you lose, use clean syringes, you, you know, basically don't purchase prevent fatal overdose like we were able to do by 50% in Chittenden County 2018 to 2019, I believe. But what you do is you lower the health care costs. And a lot of us are on Medicaid. So, I mean, that's 50% of Medicaid is, is paid with our, with our tax money. 50% of Medicaid, and Vermont's one of the highest per capita Medicaid tax burdens in the country because of these programs. 50% of Medicaid is paid by state money, and 50% is backed federally by every other state. And so, like, if you get HIV, if you get hepatitis B or C, which is stuff that that particular program and our clean syringe exchange helps you with, you know, it's a higher cost to the person as well, you know, as, as everything else that stems from not, them not having treatment or, or being judged or stuff like that. You know, and and here in Rutland, it's open two days a week. And one of the first things I did was get those safe injection supplies. So if somebody needed access to that type of thing, they could just call me or text me at my number. And I'm like, yeah, here's just some, some safe injection supplies, whatever. Use safely, please. This is what I know. Um, follow me on Instagram for more information. Uh, that's one of the first things I did. It's only open two days a week. You know, so, I mean, it's difficult to get those supplies to have them last, you know, a week or more. And if it's only open two days a week, what you're having is people, you know, use the same syringes over and over again, share syringes, and they have a disease. And when there's something like COVID, it's even more, you know, whatever. But because we don't have that kind of hub for access for that type of, you know, harm reduction treatment, what you see in Rutland, which is great, but you see ER visits like something like three times what they are in the rest of the state. So Rutland has a great, you know, um, uh, healthcare, um, you know, facility. Uh, but the issue with it is it's not type one or type two or whatever when it comes to trauma. So they actually fly a lot of people, which costs a lot of money, actually. Um, but I mean, they're probably, you know, make more money than they even though they're a nonprofit um, to Dartmouth. Um, Burlington flies to Dartmouth less often is because they're a trauma two center and Dartmouth trauma one and down here in Rutland, they're probably trauma three or something. But what you have with their healthcare facility is you have that, you know, you have that particular, um, um, you know, ER have, uh, visits, uh, three times, you know, they, 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 they see people in there three times more often than any other ER in the state. So it's great that they're, you know, being non-judgmental that they're there for people suffering fatal overdose and stuff like that. But if you look at the last findings report for 2021, um, when it comes to substance use care, what you see specifically in Rutland at the ED is ED visits pertaining to fatal overdose or seeking of substance use treatment um, three times higher than other state. So you want any other county, or you know, so you wonder why are they three times higher than other county? One, they have that type of, you know. Um, and then I guess there's one in, in St. John's for two. They have that type of, you know, ED. But so why in Burlington are visits to the ER or ED three times less than Rutland? I'll tell you why. Safe recovery and everything that me and people like Grace Keller do for people with substance use disorder and everything that people like me and my friends who say, yeah, bro, I, I used heroin for four years. It's not a big deal. You know, I love hockey. You know, it's respecting my captain. I'd so much rather be playing hockey than, uh, you know, using drugs. You know, but it, it is what it is. You know, it's hiring me. And, you know, six years ago, I made a mistake and sold some drugs. And uh, I don't break the law today. You know, like, uh, that's kind of the attitude we have. And and we have that program, that hub of kind of helping people get treatment through non-judgment. Because it's difficult to walk into the doors of an agency or to walk in the doors of an AA meeting and admit that you have a problem with substance use disorder. Um, if you can go into some place like Safe Recovery that they just talk to you and they're really kind of okay with you using and stuff like that you know, what happens is you have access to treatment, you have brochures, you have someone to talk to, you have someone that can get you MAT on the spot, you have someone that can get you residential treatment or make a phone call to kind of do a screening to see if you're eligible for substance use care, refer you to the Howard Center in a different program, you have all that just because you don't feel judged when you go in to, to, to get something to, to, to basically use the drugs that you enjoy. Um, but we're talking about a difference in kind of conservative minded culture versus a very, very progressive minded um, community from Burlington. And I, 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 I told the line, so I'm very critical of the Democratic Party, even though I, I vote for them something like 60 or 70 percent of the time. And I'm, I'm from Chinook County, so I'm very liberal when it comes to a lot of politics. But I'm very, very fiscally responsible. I'm a very conservative person, 
um, but I'm very liberal minded in my attitude towards things like progressive substance use treatment, progressive criminal justice reform, and mental health treatment, which is what I do for a living with some of the best statistics and best clinical training in the country. If you want to know more, you can purchase my writing. Um, but you know, to make a long story short, I'm very progressive minded. I'm very liberal minded when it comes to a lot of these things, but I'm very critical of the democratic party for a reason. Vermont increased their budget by a billion dollars last year, a billion dollars. And a lot of that's federally backed. So Vermont is one of the highest per capita federal tax burdens. They just took $38 million, you know, from Congress, from Congress in order to fund a housing program. And they did it because they wouldn't listen to me three years ago when it came to expanded public and EBIT access. So in, in 2019, the, the real issue became housing. And it's been housing for years. You know, John Brooklyn has talked about it. Brandon Del Pozo talked about it. Me and Uli Shaguli and Tom Dalton kind of worked together for a little while to come up with this idea that they'd been kind of snowballing around. And then I've written it into, into practice. And I've been advocating for the last three years to expand access to public inebriate. And Tom Dalton does some special interest stories. And I think Uli went to, to Greece or something because she was tired of running that program. Um, but to make a long story short, when there's a difference in conservative mining culture versus liberal mining culture, and I do this for work, you know, I'm not a volunteer. Um, you know, when there's a difference in that culture, it makes it harder for people to seek treatment. So it's a good thing that people are seeking treatment, you know, at Rutland and stuff like that. But the big issue that I'm talking about is the manufacturing plant is expanding your hours, you know, when it comes to the safe injection site from something like two to five hours, and it's paying me to do this. I graduate top of my class, not to, you know, welfare for the rest of my life. Thank you. Um, if you expand kind of the hours within, you know, the safe injection site to five days a week, you get more people in there. If you have rapid access to MAT at that facility, if you have rapid access to MAT at the hospital, you'll see a reduction in fatal overdose and an increase in, 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 in seeking treatment like we had in Chittenden County. I mean, you're able to do that if you listen to your valedictorian who's been in Rutland for a year and a half. And I see the benefits of kind of, you know, that uh, cocky Caucasian attitude where probably domestic violence and aggravated assaults and assaults and batteries are much higher. No, but what you have is probably lower instances of, 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 of basically um, um, incidents involving guns and drugs. And I've been talking about that for years, eliminating guns and drugs, you know, with a culture that exists in Rutland. You know, but, you know, we're looking at lower property values, so you have a difficult time funding programs. We're looking at you know, how can you expand rapid access to MAT. We're looking at, you know, how to change patrol division to be friendly. And this is one of the reasons why I have like 30 cases right now with the Vermont Supreme Court about how we police locally. And we're trying to get to where we should be, but we're not there yet. And I do this for work. Um, so basically, like, you know, what I'm kind of getting at is if we change the way we police, we can allow access to treatment. We can allow, you know, friendlier interactions. We can change, you know, the culture of criminal culture to you know, enjoying time with law enforcement, like when Brandon Del Pozo and I used to chat about MAT. And I was like, you know, cops have been the enemy for 10 years, bro. I'm having a really hard time hating you, bro. You know, I mean, that was a, 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 like, like, like an aha moment for me when it came to, you know, I, I was conditioned to hate law enforcement for 10 years because of what I went through as, as someone that used substances. And because I could sit down with Brandon Del Pozo and talk about fatal overdoses and access to MAT, suddenly the cops weren't the enemy anymore. But every time I have a bad interaction with law enforcement, suddenly they're the enemy anymore. And it's because of most of them, uh, very few of them have my training or anything similar. You know, so we have a manufacturing plant. We have an expanding hours. And I like to get paid for this. We have expanded hours at their, you know, safe injection facility from two to five um, days. And we have to fund that somehow. Most of it comes from ADAP, and most of ADAP's funding is federally backed when people don't meet ADAP requirements. And most of ADAP's funding could be freed up if they listen to me when it came to how they do housing. But that's a talk for a different time. And if you change the attitude of policing with patrol division, not just you know projects like Project Vision, what you have is police interacting with the people that break the law, with the people that need access to treatment that aren't going to the ED that aren't going to the safe injection site. You have basically a person like me that non-judgmentally asks to jumpstart your car rather than busts you and throws you in Marlboro Valley for three years. So that way they have access to treatment, that way they enjoy interacting with law enforcement, and that way recidivism when it comes to reoffense doesn't skyrocket because when they get out of prison, the police aren't the enemy. Suddenly U.S. probation is my best friend instead of my enemy because of the way they treated me and because of the way my case was investigated indicted and adjudicated 
But all that aside, the big issue is culture. So lower economic status and that, you know, directly is proportional to the amount of spending money that you have in Rutland in their municipal budget when it comes to schooling, when it comes to after school programs, when it comes to things like Raha hockey, when it comes to things like community development. This is money that comes from our property taxes and our property taxes are lower. So typically the school system is less. So typically you're stuck in this cycle. of criminal deviance. And a lot of it is, you know, things like, you know, uh, you know, Burlington, um, Burlington Tech, you know, uh, Essex Tech, you know, but I'm so conservative, man, that I'll just be like, yeah, you know, if your son wants to learn how to do an oil change, he should come over to my house. Yeah, if your son, you know, wants to learn a bit about about the law, he should come over to my house and play chess with me. And we can I can talk about Justice Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. You know, I'm so conservative, I'll teach my neighbors my trade for free when it comes to who I am as a person. But the biggest piece isn't just kind of the funding that goes along with that and the education to keep people away from narcotics. And it thinks it's things like literacy. It's, you know, when you educate people, even if they're, you know, not, you know, achieving upward mobility to make 50, 60, 70 or $100,000 a year if they're in a manufacturing job, you know, what that does is it just, it prevents people from breaking a lot, prevents people from getting in fights, it prevents people from dropping out of school, and it provides, you know, allows people to use substances generally less and, and do less prison time. Just education. It's one of the reasons why almost everything that I do, I try to uh, promote literacy, because if people can't read, then they're just going to wind up in prison. You know, it's one of the reasons why I, I, I like hip hop so much. You know what I mean? But this is what I do for a living, and I'm not interested in working with the state of Vermont at this point because of the way I've been treated. I need to go to prison, basically, because the state of Vermont misallocated $160 million to watch over 100 people overdose over three years. So I'm not interested in working with them. You know, this is just a lecture, and they can do with it what they want. But if they, they actually want to respect their valedictorian six years of that I've given for free to Vermont, they can pay me. But they probably won't. They'll probably listen to this lecture and implement the programming and talk about how they know it all and then put me in prison. You know, that that's the status quo right now for my coworkers, which is really upsetting. Really upsetting that they want to treat me like less than a human being. And then you wonder why the state of Vermont's recidivism statistics are ninety or ninety five. And then you wonder why the federal governments are less than fifty. Because of the way you treat me. You wonder why people overdose when you wonder why people recidive you know use again it's something like 40 to 90 percent because the way you treat me you know but those those are the major issues when it comes to kind of providing access to service but if you change the attitude if you do more special interest stories on who kyle wolf is rather than the man that threatens you know i'm a social justice advocate man you know i coach hockey for free you know uh um, after school um, you know, I pick up trash, you know, I do harm reduction stuff, you know, I advocate, I worked in human services for five years, I go to, you know, AA and NA meetings sometimes and give back there, I used to sponsor and balance their budget and everything like that as their treasurer. Um, this is stuff that I do, but uh, all that Rutland knows is that I did a protest. And they don't even know that I did the protest, they think I'm some stalker that threatens people. You know, they don't know that I was in Montpelier to do a protest to kind of talk to people how to defund the legislature, how to defund the local police when your local politicians won't won't listen through tax withholdings. That's why I had a gun. It's a ninth article issue. It's a second amendment issue withholding taxes. It is. You know, and I'm involved in like seventy cases in their Supreme Court to prove my point that overly stringent conditions of release and unnecessary violations result in over a quarter of our prison population and fatal overdose and doesn't help anybody. You know, but what we're talking about is changing the culture, changing the culture of Rutland. And I do like to get paid for this, and I do like to get thanked for this. And I am currently probably going to have to do prison time because the state of Vermont and my coworkers didn't want to respect me as a professional. And I'm leaving Vermont because of it. Like, I can't emphasize that enough. It's how you treat your clients. I have an education. I come from an affluent family. And I reoffended because my coworkers in the state government treat me like garbage. And that's why your statistics are 95% recidivism. And I've been trying to work with you for three years and you don't want to respect me. And as a result, your budget's $8 billion, 210 people overdosed, and something like 500 people are needlessly incarcerated. Those are the statistics associated with my coworkers in state government. And I walked away from this in 2021. I said, you know, if you want to keep policing this way, if you want to keep 
uh, providing substance use care this way, if you want to keep funding those programs this way, I'm walking away. I walked away in 2021. I did things like support your local grower and I tried to join the military. In 2021, my coworker statistics were 210. 210 fatal overdoses. It should have been around 90. Well, the fentanyl, I've done lectures on the calculus of the fentanyl. I don't think that's the real issue here. And typically, my coworkers don't use calculus curves to look at things like, you know, types of substances use and how, how they're using and how many people are using stuff that's difficult to track with a dark figure of substance use, which is statistics that you can't track. So again, if you backtrack beyond like how you treat people, which is what I've been trying to do with local law enforcement, lead in procedural justice and try to have some rulings in the Vermont Supreme Court to help me with that effort. What you're left with is a culture. A culture typically of less education, a culture typically, you know, uh, of, of people, you know, that, you know, find it difficult to have help from social services that have less money to, to pay for social services and people that have a harder time taking not just those social services, but knowing kind of where to access them. And I like to get paid for this. So what you can do is do stuff like you can do in Chittenden County. So in Chittenden County, we have, um, um, I do this for a living, by the way. Um, you, you have, um, uh, you know, um, what are they called? Sharps containers in our bathrooms. So in places like in a lot of our grocery stores, you know, they have sharps containers. So you can just put your you know, sharps in the grocery. And then I spent my free time, again, training people at grocery stores to use Narcan to, 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 to talk to the right people. And they're like, hey, listen, it's just five minutes. If, if you're, you know, oxygen deprived to your brain for five minutes, like, you know, you can, you can die. So if someone's in the bathroom for more than five minutes, then it looks sketchy. Just knock on the door and see if they're doing right. I did this at, you know, coffee shops, you know, other all places that have sharps containers in the mall. Um, in Burlington, Vermont, and, and asked them if they had Narcan or if they wanted to be trained on Narcan um, and told them where they could do that and, and offered to do it for them f- um, for free. I did that for a couple of years. I did training in, in, in public bathrooms that had sharps containers. And if you have sharps containers, you know, that's basically a safe injection site. And the government, the federal government can't sponsor a safe injection site because of the the, the funding and, and, the, and, and the legality of you know, promoting criminal activity when, when you're kind of tying it into funding. It's why they defunded Planned Parenthood. It's why the state government's having a hard time with banking when it comes to regulated cannabis industry. It's just a can of worms. And state government's having a hard time supporting it because of safe driving. And safe driving is a serious issue when it comes to substance use in Vermont. And it's why we had to sentence someone else to something like three years on a negligent homicide in Lamoille County when I, or a negligent operation of vehicle. And that resulted in a death um, when I was their intern and one of the best restorative justice um, centers um, in the country. Um, but I mean, basically, you know, what I'm getting at is, is you need to change the attitude towards substance use care. You know, you need to change the attitude towards uh, accepting social services and stuff like that. Because, you know, if you don't, what happens is crime. So if I'm unwilling to go to a local food shelf and, and, and get some food, if I'm unwilling to, you know, walk into a um, treatment facility, um, instead of the ER, if I'm unwilling to, you know, kind of, uh, accept that type of social services help, which is great for hard work and ethics like that in a town that's more blue collar. What happens is, is kids that slip through the cracks because of a poor education system. What happens is those kids are conditioned to think it's okay to steal, to think that it's okay to do commit property crimes. And what happens in that culture when property crimes are occurring, when it comes to petty theft and stuff like that is this, and Rutland, you know, they have security guards in their grocery stores. They have armed security guards in their dollar stores and stuff like that because of petty theft. And it's like, man, I'm telling you, like, I do this for work. You know, like, people aren't stealing from the grocery store. They're not stealing, you know, from these then to, to fund their drug habit. You know, they're doing it because all their money goes through their drugs and then they need to support their families. So it's like, you know, there's a difference between stealing from like a retail outlet to, to, to get drugs or stealing from Home Depot to get drugs and stealing from a grocery store because you can't feed yourself. You know, but in Shannon County, it's pretty widely acceptable to go to the food shelf or to get, you know, dinner at Sally's or to have lunch at the day station or get a breakfast, you know, at the, the, the food shelf. Especially if you're struggling, it's pretty acceptable to, to be seen at Safe Recovery if you're using heroin like me and my friends used to then instead of playing hockey. You know, like uh, it's just a different attitude. So if you're willing to accept those social services when you're struggling, if you're willing to kind of be seen chilling at safe recovery or anything else, or or just to talk openly about your addiction, you know, what happens is people commit property crimes left. 
less. People seek treatment more. So when you go to the ER and there's rapid access to MAT, like that's great. But you can walk into your healthcare provider and ask for MAT because there's less stigma. You can go to the food shelf and then ask for help because there's less stigma. You can use drugs safely in your grocery store because you know if you do it smartly, if you clean up after yourself, the clerk might just knock on the stall and ask if you're okay after five minutes. But you have to change the attitude. How do you change the attitude in a largely conservative city? The Rutland Herald and other media applications can do special interest stories on people like me that are open and honest about their addiction instead of ruining my name in the family in, in, in the paper. And that's what happened. You guys covered in a certain way because the prosecutors and whomever said a certain thing, the police said a certain thing, and now my family name is ruined. You know, if you look at all the other articles, I'm honest about my heroin addiction and my time in the federal system. I gave a lecture at Recovery Day three years ago with T.J. Donovan, Dr. Brooklyn, and the health commissioner. I gave a lecture. I spoke about recovery housing uh, next to the state house for about 10 minutes and kind of what, you know, being a heroin addict was like, what the federal criminal justice system was like, and how recovery housing helped me rehabilitate myself. I spoke at recovery day at the state house three years ago before I was wrongfully accused of being a threatening menace by a woman that doesn't know me at all and claims to be from my town. That was me speaking at recovery day with TJ Donovan and our health commissioner three years ago. At our state house. So if the media covers me in a different way, suddenly people aren't feeling the stigma around getting treatment. People aren't feeling the stigma around getting food and stuff like that. And it starts with accurate media coverage of who I am as a person, not a mistake that I may or may have not made. And I, I, it wasn't even proven in court, this stuff. You know, it's been put in the paper. I've had to put cease and desist orders in this media outlets. And I've called them multiple times and asked for their respect, and I still don't have it. You know, but that's what you can do. It starts with the media. And if you have a manufacturing job, you have more people paying. More people doing home renovation. And you can talk about things like gentrification and stuff like that, too. But I like to get paid for this. Um, I'm leaving Vermont. You know, the way that the state of Vermont, the way that my coworkers have treated me the last two years, three years, like, I can't do much more for the state of Vermont. And not only have none of them thanked me, they ruined my professional reputation. They called me crazy to the media. They threw me in a mental health evaluation hole for three and a half months. Um, They continue to call me crazy, violent, threatening to the media. Bro, look at who I am. I did this stuff for five or six years professionally. My entire life is public service. You know, and because of Washington County and your Speaker of the House and other things, and I'm sure I'll get violated just for saying that, my life is ruined. And it's because your Speaker of the House and my coworkers didn't follow their ethics. You guys failed to communicate with me, and our state spent something like 160 to $130 million to watch over 100 of our kids overdose. That's on my coworkers. And what they did was go on the offensive and ruin my professional reputation because I did a protest rather than sue them. But yes, if you're looking to basically change the attitude and and have less property crimes in Rutland, which is a very serious issue, not only can you have a good manufacturing plant, what you can do, other than rapid access to to, to treatment in places like the ED, you know, uh, expanded hours to, um, uh, um, you know, their safe injection site, And progressive policing policies and procedures to have that first contact be a good one with law enforcement is you can start accurately covering who people are in the media.